What's up everybody, Troy Cartwright here. Welcome to 10 Year Town. Some quick housekeeping before we get started. Um, if you guys can continue to rate and review the show on uh, Apple and Spotify or wherever you listen to this podcast, it helps us out a ton. Um, we've already been raising a bunch in the rankings and that kind of thing just helps us reach more people. So we appreciate it and uh, I hope you love the show. You've never met anybody quite like Win Barble. On this week's episode of Ten Year Town, I sit down with Wynn, my dear friend. You know him from songs like Waiting on a Woman by Brad Paisley, Have You Forgotten by Daryl Worley, Me and My Kind by Cody Johnson. He even wrote a song with me one time called Breaking Every Heart in Texas. If you have the opportunity to see him in a writer's round, he will have your sides hurting from laughing so hard. I know I was smiling a lot during this interview, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Without further ado, Win Barble. Good to go. Are we are we rolling? All right. Well, yeah. When when is the last time I saw you? I'm trying to remember. I think we were riding last time I saw. Was it like a year ago? Probably. Dang. Yeah. Goes on by quick. It really does. What you been doing? Writing songs? Yeah. Same thing. They won't hire me at McDonald's. <laughs> they might. <laughs> they might. They might. They get hard up enough. Yeah. So I, I always start this this thing off with the same question. Okay. Which is, uh, how long have you been in town, Win Varble? I've been here about thirty one years. Okay. Where from? Whereabouts? Uh, I moved here from Florida, but I'm from Georgia originally, but okay. I just happened to be living down there when I moved up here. But I was playing gigs. Let me turn this thing off. All right. Um, I would went down there showing horses. Yeah. And uh, end up staying about eight years down there playing gigs Dang. and end up playing one place about six years. And then finally I was... You got played it. at the same the same place for six years, oh, like yeah, a, like a honky tonk kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, I had the house gig and and I thought I hit about thirty two and I thought I better if I'm gonna, I better get serious about something. <laughs> when you first started writing, did that did that really impact anything that you wrote? Just having been trying to keep people on the dance floor, so I remember that kind of infected my songwriting brain for a while when um, I first got started. <clears throat> well, not really for me because back then. The dance floor would fill up when you did a ballad too, you know. Oh yeah, so that's true. Didn't matter. Yeah. Um, most of those, most of the guys back then were waiting on a slow one anyway. Uh, I see. Before they wanted to dance, you know. Yeah. They wanted to get out there and <laughs> you know rub bellies with them gals, you know. Yeah. Get them a big handful or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. That's yeah. still probably true. I, you know, ballads. Well, People say they want tempo, but I don't think that's always true. When you moved up here, did you know anybody? You were kind of doing the thing. So you yeah, I, I came up here one summer in 82, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> I ran into a guy named Dave Gibson who was writing songs up here. Yep. And he was a really good singer, and uh, we kept in contact uh, through the years, and uh, he was – he really liked my songwriting, and he wanted me to stay then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just kind of felt like I need to go do a little bit more living before I before committed to this. Yeah, I needed some stuff to write about, you know. Uh, so, yeah, that's true. So I did. I went and left for 10 years, and I finally came back. And wow. I was just like, all right, I'm ready now. Plus, my back's against the wall. I got to get something going here. You <laughs> got to figure this out. <laughs> like, did it take a while to get a – publishing deal and get some it stuff took, going uh, yeah it, it took probably a year it was about a year and a half really okay and it was uh i was talking to a lot of publishers and how, how, how did it work like honestly i don't even really know how it works now if i really think about <laughs> it but <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> but uh how would you get on a publisher's <clears throat> radar it's kind of the same as now you okay. know i mean you're you go out, I mean, we'd go out and play these writers' nights and stuff, and uh, and and you'd somehow get in a room with somebody who'd done a little something, you yeah. know, and uh, I had a, we had a little band when I moved to town, I put together this band called Hauling Oats, and uh, it was H-A-U-L-I-N. Yeah, that's and, uh, pretty good. 
and we played VFWs and little bars around town. And yeah, people like Aaron Barker. I don't know if you know Aaron, but mm -hmm. he he wrote a bunch of that old George Strait stuff, and he would come listen to us, you know. And he he was like, man, you need to come talk to my publisher. And then I had this bass player who wrote for the same company, which was George Strait's company. Yeah. And uh, I had several meetings with those guys and Russ Zavison over at Music Mill. And finally I went and met uh, Dave Gibson, actually called Cliff Williamson. He said, you got, you need to hear some of this guy's stuff. So I went over and met with Starstruck and, uh, and they, they pretty much agreed to sign me that day. So the next day I had a meeting back over at Muy Bueno over at Straits. And they said, uh, well, we've been talking to you for six months. How come you go went with them? And I said, because they bit. Y'all just nibbled. <laughs> <laughs> so I want somebody who's excited. About yeah, it, who know? cares? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I like the excitement thing, you know, mm -hmm. when somebody's, you know, really digging you enough to just pull the trigger, you know, so. Man. Yeah, they got to care. I mean, that's kind of the whole, yeah. the whole thing, right? Yeah. If Even, they start out lukewarm, where in the hell are they going from there? You know. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's uh, it's tough once once their uh, the heat's been turned down a yeah. lot of times. Yeah. Just trying to get somebody to care at yeah, all. Yeah, you know? for sure. Do I were you there for a long time? Like, what was that? I was there for eight years, okay. and they sold to Warner Chapel. Okay. I had written all over town. You know how we yeah. do. We go from mm -hmm. go to this publisher and just meeting different people, writing Absolutely. with them, and. And Warner Chapel was probably my least favorite place to write. And when they sold, when Starstruck sold the catalog and, and the writers and we went over there, I was just like, of all the places, you know. It just seemed very corporate, you know. What but, was it? It's a little better now, but like were the writer rooms, were the, were the like literally were the writer rooms like corporate and bad or was it just kind of the... Just the whole kind of vibe. And, and yeah. they were in a different building then. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so... Right before we got over there, they had moved over in the big building. I went over there and, you know, I mean, you got to go to work, you know. And yeah. It mattered to me, but I just thought it was going to be a big uh, adjustment because I was going from a small company to a really big company. Yeah. And, uh, but it worked out great. I had, you know, some of my best years over there. So what was your. Sometimes you think it's going to be bad and it ends up good. You know? Well, that's a. There's a life lesson in that for sure. What what was your like? What was the first the first big hit? I mean, I don't know what you'd call a big hit, but my first song on the radio that was a single that was like fifteen or whatever mm -hmm. was a thing Sammy Kershaw did mm. called "Fit to Be Tied Down," and uh, <clears throat> it was uh, I was able to go buy me a truck with air conditioning and stuff in it. You know, That's so pretty good. It was the first vehicle I had with AC. Wow. Know. And I lived in Florida for six or eight yeah, years. Yes, so that's, you know? that's tough. Oh, my God. <laughs> Running with the windows down a lot down yeah. there, you know. And then, you know, things just, you know how it is. You, you, you kind of get rolling, and it's uh, it's hard to get that first one, you know what I mean? Because when you come to Nashville, you people listen with a different ear to a new writer, mm -hmm. you know. When they, when they listen to somebody who's had hits, they listen, listening for a hit. Mm. And when you're a new writer, they're listening for something wrong with it. You know what I mean? It seems yeah. like, you know, like, yeah. like, I don't know if I can take a chance on this. This guy ain't never wrote a hit before, you know? Interesting. It's a kind of a catch 22, but once yeah. you kind of get on the other side of that, I mean, it just takes a couple of times and then you're kind of the new hot guy, you know? Yeah. Like, you, it's mm -hmm. almost like you get a, uh, I remember with our buddy, Brett Tyler. Yeah. I was like, man, this is, this guy's one of the best writers I've ever written with. Yeah. And it seemed like, you know, he was having some success, but nothing crazy. And then he kind of got the jacket. Yep. Almost. And then, yeah, it's, I that's guess, he, I guess he's doing all right now. Yeah. He's doing great. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is like, you, you ain't until you are. That's right. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it's like everybody, but I mean, like Brett, like when I met Brett and wrote some songs with him, you know, me and you wrote a bunch of songs That's with right. him and you just kind of know he's going to do all right, you know? Yeah. And Craig Wiseman was, when I first moved to town, Craig was catching fire, you know, mm. to all us new writers. He was kind of the guy that was like, 
he was one of us not too long ago, but now he's pretty hot, you know. Yeah. And I remember one night I played this thing over there at the Boardwalk Cafe. It was a little writer show, and Craig had just got down from playing, and he was still sitting out there, and, and he called me over the table after uh, I got done with my little set there, and and he said, "Man, you're gonna you're gonna be all right." He said, "You're gonna you're gonna do fine in this business." He said, "I know it. We all kind of second guess ourselves and yeah. all that, but he said, I'm just telling you, don't sweat it, man. Just have man. fun, you know." So he was right, you know. I mean, and you try to pass that encouragement on to other people, you know, because yeah, because you know how much it means to you when you're sitting up here living on pork and beans and stuff, you know. Yep. Yeah, I'll never forget when I got dropped from my record deal. Not that many people called, but you called. Yeah. I'll never forget that. Oh. You know? Well. I needed the, you know, I knew I'd be all right. I wasn't, yeah. like, going to go home. Right. But it was hard. I, well, fe I, felt, I felt like I sucked or rejected, and I know, you know, it meant a lot to me that you did that, especially because I, I know we, we were kind of felt like we were on the cusp of, having maybe some action a little yeah. hit together and then it all just kind of yeah went away like a viper yeah and it's like man yeah that it's sucks tough, man. it's tough man that's i don't know that's an important lesson you know you just pay it forward where you can and i, I as much as i can and i always try and be encouraging to, to people well and, and that doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything really in the grand scheme of things you know Alan Jackson got turned down twice by every label in town. You yep. know? And yeah. And look what happened there. You know? He's he's all right. Yeah. He did, he did all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> if if yeah. he keeps on, you know. That's right. That's right. Hearing a word of encouragement from someone that that's doing it too. Yeah. That means the most. Like when Craig Wiseman tells you, like, you need yeah. to be all right. You know, you're like, all right. I mean, that guy he he's been around. Know. He knows. Hopefully. You know. <laughs> so it's just, but it's a crazy it's you know, it's a hard business sometimes. It's tough. You and gotta have a thick hide. To be you in do. That business. You do. You got to. Uh, you got to be able to weather a couple storms for sure. That's for sure. You know. Yeah. And and you know what? It it just makes you better. Strengthens your resolve, and it it makes you tougher, and it makes you. I mean, probably makes you a better writer. Yeah. Somehow. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And a better artist, probably. You know. I mean, I had a record deal back in two thousand. Somewhere around 2001 to about 2003 with Sony. And really what, because I didn't move here to be an artist. I moved here to be a writer. Sure. It wasted a lot of my time, that artist stuff. They always, really? You know, you know, you know how the label's oh, always. Oh, yeah, you got a lot of stuff. stuff. And, 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 and after, you know, maybe it was three years, two or three years, and I was just like, they had a new president, came in the label and took over, and they changed the whole regime mm -hmm. and and i you know when i had my meeting with all the other new artists you know i think they kept montgomery gentry they kept patty loveless and the chicks and i think everybody else got washed got the out boot. the door you know yeah. what you know that's gonna happen sure you know? so they called me in for my meeting you know and i said listen guys i said don't lose no sleep over me i said i'm i'm already tired of this crap I was like, <laughs> if y'all ain't 150 percent into what i'm doing man just i'll go i'll go write songs because that's what i really love to do yeah they obliged me there you go they were they were kind enough to say all right <laughs> then go the do door. that then you you clearly love the game you know you love writing songs yeah why like what is it has it always been with you since you were I you think know, ever a little since kid I, and... yeah, I think ever since I picked up a guitar, I wanted to write songs. Yeah, and uh, the actual process of writing songs is mm -hmm. fun to me. Like a little puzzle, you gotta yeah, solve. and and it's like uh, getting you know if you get a great idea, you know, and you're thinking, oh man, I can I can't wait to write that. I'm about to write this in my pants, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. You're like. You know, and but you gotta, you kind of gotta. And a lot of times, I've never been a guy to save an idea mm. for like some big artist or some big writer. If I if I get an idea on the way into town and I have a write that morning with this guy that just stepped off the bus, yeah. I'm probably gonna write that idea with him. You wow. know, because I just figure that God gave me that idea for today. You know. Yeah. And uh, 
and 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 to be honest with you, I've had I've had as much success writing songs with uh, writers you never heard of than as I have big writers. You yeah. Know? So, as well, I, I I wonder if there's something to that immediacy also. Yeah. Like as I sometimes, you know, some publisher they ain't ever written a song is like, you know, you should you should save it. Yeah. You should save those good ideas for whatever. And it's like, I don't know. I that's never done me any good. Yeah. You know? Yep. My best songs are always I just can't wait to write it. And that yeah. usually means I thought of it that day. Yeah. Because otherwise I mean there are ideas that we have that are really good ideas. Yep. And and we'll go in and write. <clears throat> As you well know, you get in there and you throw a few ideas back and forth and sure. nobody bites on it. And you're like, okay, I'll keep that one then. You yeah, know? I'll say I'm, I'm glad to keep it. You know, I don't, I don't do it on purpose, but you know, if you say, uh, me and I just had a, uh, new cut on Cody Johnson record. Uh, and I had this idea called watching my old flame go out. Mm. And I knew I had to write it with somebody that, I mean, it was going to write itself. It was yeah, like one of those ideas. Good you know? title. And, uh, <clears throat> so I got one day with uh with zooming on uh with Clint Daniels and Cat Higgins and I said, I know y'all are gonna get this idea. And I think I told one other person about it and yeah, they wanted to write something up tempo or something. I was like, That's cool, I'll keep it, you know. Yeah. And uh, I kinda told them, I, I laid it out, I said, This gal's getting ready to go out and this guy's watching her and it's he's eating him up, you know, and uh and and they're what they have has been over for a long time, you mm. know. And they both know it, you know. Yeah. And it's the hardest thing watching my old flame go out, you know. Wow. And it's like <clears throat> Clint was like, Oh shit, man, that's a good down hook right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh I mean we wrote it in about an hour and you know. Yeah. But that's the way the good ones go a lot of times. You know? Yeah, quick. How how'd you get it to where it needed to go? You just to send Cody and him, yeah. I sent it to Trent. That was it. Yeah, and yeah. He, he he fell out over it. So that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean that's that's the way. And you know as well as I do, you can have a song and man, it's hot and 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 everybody's like falling over about it, you know, and jumping up and down. And, mm -hmm. and then <clears throat> a month goes by and nobody cuts it, and you're like, it's still a great song, you know. I know. But it just gets cold, you know. Have you ever had one of those kind of <laughs> get resuscitated back to life? Yeah, sure I have. All right, it gives me hope. I yeah. feel like I got a well of yeah great songs sitting. Yeah, you know, in my catalog. well. I mean, some songs get cut right away. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a little more country than that. I was five years old when they got cut. Really? Yeah. Wow. And Were they still pitching it, or did you did you kind of? I, I think. Uh, I, yeah, they were still pitching it, but. Uh, Cos Weaver pitched it over to uh, Carson Chamberlain. Okay. And he was working with this new kid, Easton Corbin. And Carson said, Man, I'm going to cut that song on this kid. And I said, Cut on, brother. There ain't nobody else beating the door down. <clears throat> so he did. Wow. And uh, he come and played it for me in his in his Jeep. He pulled up there behind BMG or something one day. And what was I at? That was back in the Warner Chapel days. But I was over there somewhere else. Yeah. And, he said, where are you at? And I said, I'm in the alley back here. And he pulled back there and he said, jump in and listen to this thing, you know. Wow. And um, it's think pretty it much pretty like, good? I thought it sounded great because he, cause he copied our demo pretty much. Oh, there you, know? you go. And uh, which, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know. No. I thought, well, and he said, I think it's going to be his first single. I'm like, really? Dang. So that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, but not in your control, right? Not in my control. So, that's right. It's all good. Yeah. Man, five years, that's that's a pretty long time. So. I always I always thought that song was a hit and Man. uh I don't know why. Yeah. It was when when we wrote it, it was one of those songs that I had a session coming up and I was like looking for looking through old songs and I wanna say it might have been on a cassette. I'm not sure. Wow. No, no. Well it might have been. It might have been. Anyway, Went through there and I said, "Well, this thing's. I mean, it's it's pretty good, I guess, you know." And I yeah. threw it on a session and and it just came to life, you know, in the demo session. And after that, and, and I mean, 
had two co-writers on it. Neither one of them even showed up for the demo session. They weren't that. But back then, that meant they didn't care. They didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was, they weren't that excited. You know, I mean, we demoed songs all the time, and then, you know, they were excited after it got cut though and went number oh, one. Oh, I, I bet they, they were, were very excited. I bet they were. Do you uh, do you miss? I I feel like when I first moved here, so I hadn't even been that long, six seven years. They you know, you could go down every Tuesday, Wednesday to Legends or wherever and hop on a demo session. Yeah. I don't I don't even know. Does that, st- I guess that still exists somewhere, but There's you got to put it together. It. I think, does Elias still do them? Or? I think he does, yeah. Yeah. It, it just a, used to be like, you could always throw one in there. Now, it feels like you got to sort, you know, you got to kind of. got to hunt it down, you know. You yeah. do. And it, and it, and it makes it, you know, that, that friction to get the thing done the pressure is yeah. hard yeah people don't think about it but it's like it's brain space to go oh i gotta demo this song now i gotta i gotta monitor this the whole way yeah you know i gotta find somebody to do it I gotta extra make, work yeah and then i gotta figure out how to get them paid it <laughs> yeah. used to be you just showed up at like legends on a you'd say i got a song that give you a time and then somehow yep. everybody got paid i don't know yeah i don't know well you i mean you know you publish your yeah, they well, you ought to have seen it in the old days. <clears throat> Troy, I'm telling you. I used to come in starstruck. You remember when they had the big two-inch tape? You yeah. Know, I had, mean, I don't remember, but yeah. I've heard about it, yeah. And this, these these spools, these reels of tape weighed about, you know, 30 pounds a piece. Mm-hmm. And you needed two of them to get through a five-song session. Okay. I I would go in there, and thank goodness, the girl at starstruck, would have my tape sitting there in the hallway, my lyric sheets, wow. and a couple of dats to put the session on after we were done. Yeah. And uh, and I'd go walking in the studio with all that stuff, you know, with my guitar wow. on my back. And then he, the, he had to get there early because the engineer had to stripe the tape, is what they called it. So he had to run this. He had to run all that tape through that machine and do some process with it. I okay. don't know what it was, but... It was like you had to get there like an hour early to do all this stuff. You know? Wow. And then when you, you know, when somebody had to overdub guitars, they had to rewind the tape. And find the spot. Find the spot, you know, and it was, and you know, that, but that, we didn't know anything better. Sure. And then when they come out with Pro Tools and all that stuff, where it's just immediate, you know. It was yeah. Like, Dang, man. I should have brought eight songs. I could have got eight songs this morning. You know? That's crazy, though. <laughs> the rewind time alone, you know. Yeah, I, di- I didn't even think about that. That I guess that's how they used to... How would you get the songs? Like, uh, how were the songs delivered to you? Delivered to you when they were done? Like, did you have... You took did they get what we did. We used to go in the studio. This is how we did it, because we were so price conscious. You sure, know? We'd rent the studio for the whole day. Yeah. Going at 10 o'clock usually and cut till one then do vocals all afternoon and background vocals and then mix all night was there no auto tune or anything like that oh there wasn't no auto tune you no. just had to you just had to be good yeah yeah so at the end of the night you know we usually get a poker game going in there in the lounge yeah and then the engineer would come in there when he had a mix up and we'd go in and listen to it and then go back and play poker and we'd say ah, turn that guitar up and then we're good you know Wow. And go back in there and play poker, and then the next Man. day you ain't worth killing because you've been up all night. You know? Yeah, but but it was fun. But you did something. Yeah, you yeah. know, I think that's a big struggle that is probably not often talked about. Is like now it's like you go to the right, it's track I in there, you are done by three. Yeah, and you don't even know, especially if nothing ends up happening with the song or whatever. It's like that you don't ever get this the sense that you built something. Yeah. To be done. You know? Yeah. That, that's my favorite thing about really demoing songs is like, yeah. You know, you get to look at this, you know, thing that you built. Yeah. From the ground up and your fingerprints are all over it. And, uh, the, the cool thing about the, the old, but back then was I would, I would just schedule a demo session once a month. I would go to yeah. a demo session and I'd pick my best five songs or whatever. And sometimes I'd have to do an extra one, you know, or whatever. But, yeah. and then you go in the studio that day. And you walked out of there the next morning with a digital audio tape, a DAT, they called it, of, was it like your, a of your whole session. Kinda, or? A little small, but it was a digital tape. It was, oh, okay. was kind of 
highfalutin. You sure. Know. Yeah, it sounds fancy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it pre- it was right before CDs came out. Okay. And you walked out of there, and all your session, all your mixes were on there, and you took it to your publisher, and you played it for them. And that's, you know. Man. Yeah. What if they all sucked? Were they mad <sighs> that they spent all that money? Um, Man, I'll tell you, back then, we demoed everything. Yeah. I you mean, never knew, I guess. You never knew. Yeah. And if I if I would have started guessing, mm. I would have probably not demoed a lot of songs that end up getting cut. You know? Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, you don't ever know. You obviously, you know, I mean, we all have so I had a song I wasn't even going to demo. And my publisher says, just throw that on the session. And I was like, okay. And it got cut in like a, the next week, you know. Wow. I was like, dang. Okay. Pretty good. Yeah. We're not our best judges of our work. You know? No, no, we're not. And I like to think I am, but I'm usually yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what was your, what was your first number one? It was a song called Have You Forgotten. It okay. was about 9 11. Oh, yeah. I remember. Yeah. Me and Daryl Worley wrote it. Uh, he had just come back from a USO tour. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were going to write this different song. And, uh, we got to talking about the people. It had been like a year and a half since 9-11. Yeah. Actually, a little less. And uh, we got talking about the people protesting the war in Afghanistan. And mm. and I, I told him, I said, look, man, my dad, when I was growing up, way after Pearl Harbor Day, we were still observing Pearl Harbor Day at my house because my dad lost a lot of friends and stuff mm. over there. And, and everybody did, you know. I mean, it was a huge thing. And we just raised with a big sense of uh patriotism yeah and uh it just and daryl was too and it just it just rubbed us the wrong way and we wrote that song and he wanted to do it on the opry that weekend he was playing friday and saturday and his manager told him no it's too political you know hmm. and he played it for his daddy and his daddy said you damn right you're gonna do that on the opry son people hmm. need to hear that yeah. and uh i'm glad he listened to his daddy instead of his manager you know? yeah and yeah. uh, I mean that from that op, he did, <clears throat> I was over at Scruggs cutting demos Friday night, and he called me and he said, "We just did this song on the opera, and people went absolutely crazy." Man, and he said, "We're doing the TV portion tomorrow, so watch it." So I, I was at home, and he started the song, and in the middle of the first verse, everybody in the opera was on their feet. There was an old guy in the, in the second verse. They had one of those old guys way in the back, and he had one of those battleship hats on, you know. Mm-hmm. And he had a walker, and he was he was going to stand up come hell or high water, you know. And he get, he finally got up, and he took his cap and waved it wow. at him, you know. And I thought, if nothing else happens with that song, that was worth writing it right yeah. there, you know. So the response he got. Um, Powerful. Made a Stroud was out in LA and he uh he heard about it and he came back and said, We gotta go cut that song. And Daryl was right in the middle of an album that they just released and and they just trashed it. And, really? Yeah. Was that was that record out yet or no? It was out. Yeah. Oh, wow. they, just... they were on the second single, I think. Wow. And uh, they just said, No, nope, we're moving on. So wow. we cut a couple of new songs for that that record and yeah. put some other ones on there. So did it kind of change your life to it of course it did it was uh i mean we didn't even have time to turn around that song came out and in five weeks it was number one wow and we were sitting there going what the heck had just happened you know i mean and it stayed there for seven weeks and we were you know it was just yeah i mean daryl hit the road with sean hannity and george bush and he was gone all the time and Whatever they had, you know, that they couldn't get him for, they'd call me and I'd go sing the song somewhere. Man, that's <laughs> crazy. Like, what the heck? I don't even know this song. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yeah. it was fun. It was, I mean, it was fun. And then, you know, after that, uh, it what? was probably, you know, three years, two or three years before I had another one. Yeah. A couple of years, maybe. And which one was that? That was waiting on a woman. Yeah, I had, before I had another number one, I had I had singles, but not. You know. That's that one did pretty pretty all right. Yeah, too. it did good. Yeah. And uh, Brad said when he heard that song the first time, he he told me and Don, he said I'm gonna get 
Andy Griffith to be in the video. Man. And I was like, that would be so bad ass. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, you know. Wow. How long was it? What what year did you actually move to town? 90, 92. 92, so to 2003, 2003 when you had your yeah. first? Number one, yeah. Was it? Was but I had some, a radio single. I had some radio singles in the in meantime. In between there. So yeah. you were kind of, you it were staying about alive. five years, yeah. Yeah. Before I, back then it was, a, they said it was a five-year town. Now it's, now, it's, now it's 10 years. That's what I heard, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, of course, I was like every other cocky kid that got off the bus. I was like, ain't going to take me no damn five years. Brother. It was almost five years to the month. No way. Yeah. That's what they everybody told me. It says, 10 years down, Troy. And that, same thing. I said, Pfft. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I got this <laughs> yeah. by tomorrow. That's right. So I think I'm like seven in now. So I got, you know, yeah. it might come true. We'll somebody's see, we'll got out. this stuff figured out pretty good, you know. They, they, it's true. For, it's a, it's a saying for a reason, you know. Yeah. 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 Was there like one guy cleaning up all the radio singles or was it, was it very, it seems like back then it was wide open. Everybody just wrote with each other and everybody had a, they did. It was a, uh, there was a lot more writers in town. Yeah. See, back then there was probably 3,000 or more signed writers in town. Wow. But the rosters, there was, you know, probably 15 or 20 labels. Mm -hmm. And all the rosters were full and everybody was making money and country music was king. It was bigger than pop music in the 90s, you know. Yeah. And uh, Craig, was, Craig was starting to hit his lick and then uh, – at Starstruck, we had Mark D. Sanders. He was he was killing it over there, mm -hmm. and uh, it was kind of like uh, there was you know this guy was hot, DePiro, and some of these other guys yeah. were hot. You know they were like the big dogs when we came to town, and <clears throat> Craig was starting to get there, you know. But um, it was it was fun, man. It was it was a, as many riders as you know. There's three about three hundred now signed riders. It's ten percent of what it was. That's know? crazy to me. I know, and and you would think that it would have been harder with three thousand riders here, mm -hmm. but it wasn't because there was more cuts to be had, you know. And radio uh, played a lot of different stuff, you know. Yeah, you know, you might get on a record that don't ever get on the radio, but Still you know, sold. It's still, yeah, they sell some records, you know. But yeah, I'm. I spend a lot of time, probably more time than I should, trying to trying to fix that imbalance. Now, especially, it's like if it's not on the radio, you ain't making any money. Yeah. And there's a lot of songs being cut. And I've had some songs on some big records, and it's like, what is this? It's like two dollars. Yeah. Like, exactly. How, so I think about well how how am I going to make money? But also like how are these publishers exactly making yeah. any money? I mean it's it's kind of a, a tricky. But at the same time, you know, there's there's more money, almost more money now being made in music, as there it was is. as it was back then. But the it's, labels are making record profits. Yeah. So I I think. Uh, so if you own your stuff. Yeah, you, which which you, I've you seen yeah. firsthand over the last year and some change and, and it has changed my life yeah uh financially uh for sure and also just like the consistency mm -hmm. um and i've been able to bring the songwriters into that which is something i've been really right. proud of right it's getting to write checks to uh to the writers yeah you know so i know that i'm not the uh the biggest artist in the world but i'm you know hopefully well, helping somebody with their car payment or, or but whatever you know what if if I got a guy who's gonna do that, yeah, why wouldn't I want to write with him? You know what I mean? Yeah, well, and it's like some of these, like if you get, I have some friends mm -hmm. that told me they had a song on Taylor Swift's last record. Yeah, it was an album cut, big pop record, you know. Yeah, yeah, big, big, big record. Big record. They wrote it with her about fifteen years ago, and she dug it out mm -hmm. and put it on this record. They thought, all right, here we go. Yeah. And they made nine hundred dollars a piece. Man, that's crazy. It is in it's criminal. It yeah. really is. Yeah. And the thing about it is, like, if you had a, a an album cut on a pop record back in the nineties, mm -hmm. you just an album cut. Yeah. You're probably gonna make seven or eight hundred thousand dollars on a on a record that big. You know? Yeah. And 
and I don't know how because the the publishers make the same as us. Yeah, so I don't know how they're doing it either. I, I don't know. I don't know if they're a loss leader for for the labels. That you know, a lot of them at the top, the you know, Warner Chapel and Warner. The big the big publishers the big ones. that are under the label umbrella. It, yeah, they probably get the trickle down thing. You know? They do, but I, I'm sure there's people a lot smarter than me trying to solve this problem. Maybe they they have a a branding problem or something because I. I don't, I don't hear about it. No. And I'm like, I don't hear about it. I'm like beating my head against the wall, trying to change it. And half the time I talk about it, people look at me like, you know, I got a a arm coming out of my head or something. Yeah. (laughs) But it just, you know, an easy way to look at it is if a hundred dollars are coming in, well, instead of creating all this confusion with the pie, there's 85% of the master publishings here. It's just, it's like, no, just for every dollar that comes in, this much goes to the writer, this much goes to the publisher, and this much goes to the master owner. Like, let's let's yeah. figure this out. It shouldn't, it's not that complicated. It's complicated because they want it to be complicated. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, it doesn't have to be. No, I think uh, from what I understand, uh, the labels are making course they don't have to manufacture anything they don't have to mm-hmm. manufacture cds or there's i mean radio promotions about gone now i mean you know i'm sure the ones that there's just not a lot of artists on radio right now yeah the radio uh the radio thing is getting smaller right you know the and, playlists i guess so i know there's a thing among independent artists like yourself yeah that is like and i've i've heard it's called share the master mm-hmm. and I think eventually <clears throat> what could happen if they don't fix this, y'all are going to be the guys that we're going to want to write with. Sure. Because the labels, for it's lack tough. of better words, they got us bent over, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's easy to, to be, I don't want to sound pessimistic about it because yeah. I'm very optimistic on the craft of songwriting. Oh, songwriting has never been more important. I just am very passionate about us all being able to win and together. make a living doing it. And make a living because if you can't make a living, yeah, it's going to go away. That's you know, right. and that um, there's all this institutional knowledge that we're going to lose. There's there's all this stuff you can't even it don't fit on a spreadsheet, right? Right of of how much um songwriting wisdom there is and, and by supporting that middle class songwriter mm-hmm. you know the old lunch pail songwriter we call them you know? yeah that's that's the uh those people are to me the most important you know yeah i hope somebody's looking out for them you know i'm i'm trying to do my part and well and you know what we got to look out for ourselves too you yeah know? i mean that's it, they've proven that to us because they don't they don't care you know yeah. i mean luckily our you know, our publishers, you know, we'll, we all get a draw, you know. Whatever, yeah, yeah, but, they're, they're, they're fighting for us for sure. Yeah, but the publishers, to me, I don't know how this snuck up on them like it did. You know, it's yeah. like, didn't y'all see this coming? I mean, ain't this what y'all's whole deal supposed to be? Y'all supposed to know about this stuff. We're just yeah. writing songs, you know I mean? Yeah, we're supposed to not not <laughs> think about it. Yeah. You know, I think I think uh, I learned, man, the hard way. Yeah. You just kind of got to, you got to be vigilant. You got to have a lot of personal responsibility. Yeah. For all this stuff. To, yeah. To really stick around. I hope they'll get it figured out because yeah. uh, there's, there's a big piece in Nashville that the songwriting community that, that, could go away, you know yeah. what I mean? If 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 they're not careful, and, yeah. And they'll all be always be somebody who'll do it, and they won't care how much they get paid or whatever, or they'll do a little side deal with them. But I mean, right now it don't seem like, you know, the labels are blaming it on Spotify, and Spotify's blaming it on the labels, mm-hmm. and, and really it's all the same animal, you know. It's like, yeah, you know. So yeah, there's there's an opportunity. And yeah. I, I'm benefiting from it in my own very small way. Yeah. But I want to live in a world where, you know, songwriters can have a song get 10 million streams, which is a lot of streams. Yeah. But it's nothing crazy. It's not impossible. Right. You know, and, and I want to live in a world where a songwriter can get that many streams on a song they wrote and, 
and you know pay for their car payment or, yeah. or what you know it's not like somebody's trying to buy a third home in malibu We're yeah just trying exactly. to survive no, you know? no. <laughs> well and you know i mean when you get paid i don't know what the streaming rate is now you probably would uh, to yeah. a songwriter i'm talking about our part of it sure sure on a major label act yeah is point oh 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 something cents or something i i've done the math uh basically you know for every hundred dollars $85 is going to whoever owns the master. Right. So a label yeah. usually. And about $15 goes to the writer. But, you know, there's three writers. Yeah. And then there's three publishers. So that $15 gets split six ways. So that's how you kind of end up with these really small numbers. Yeah. And, you know, I I, I also understand that. Uh, well, what does the know, artist get? Oh. If the artist is not a writer. Well, if the artist does the artist own the master? No. Then nothing until the song's recouped, which could be years. Okay. So they're making nothing. But that 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 eighty five percent figure, I guess, is like the part where I'm I look at it and I go, All right. So I'm not saying that we gotta split this thing fifty fifty. Right. But what if it's instead of eighty five fifteen, what if it's seventy thirty? What yeah. if we start there? Let's just Let's start over at yeah. 70, 30 and yeah. see see how everybody feels. Yeah. Um, which is kind of where I've tried to get it to with my own. Yeah. You know. Well, good for doing you. Doing my own math. But I know we didn't come here to talk about math. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it's 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 a sticky wicket, it as is. they say. You it's know? Uh, it is. It's, it's and a I, situation. I hope that people aren't afraid to talk about it. I feel like sometimes songwriters get a little sheepish to talk about it because they're like well i don't want to piss off the some label I or something ain't, i ain't worried like, about talking about it they know what it used to be and they know what it is now <laughs> i promise you that's right <clears throat> well in that spirit of uh it's all broken uh what <laughs> what Still do you love writing songs though. i know i know i know you do um what do you if you were starting over today what's something you wish you knew somebody told me when i moved here one of the publishers I talked to, I had about 40 songs in my bag when I came up here that yeah. I would even play anybody. Sure. Know? Russ Avison told me, he said, man, he said, I think you got something good. He said, I want you to go write a hundred more songs and come back and see me. I'm like, a hundred more songs? Man. Took me my whole life to write these 40, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, he was right. He was right. I, I, I did that. And, uh, there's something about Nashville that inspires you. It's a very mm -hmm. creative town and creative people everywhere. And, and you know, you co-write and you do this stuff. No, but none of us had ever co-written a song before, they kept, before we came here, you know. I mean, yeah. I hadn't. And Me uh, <clears throat> you once you get into that, it's, it's, it's a little bit easier because all the pressure ain't on you. Mm. And, uh, I mean, I still write songs by myself, too, but I just – you know, I have to be pretty inspired, you know, because to we get do, it all the way done. Yeah, because we do this, you know, and plus we do it every day. Yeah. And and a lot of times you'll start something by yourself and you'll go, you'll get in a writing point where there ain't no ideas sticking out. Oh, and you man. go, well, I got this thing I started and I got, got a little start on. And, and then you end up writing it with them, you know. So well, yeah. you might have finished it by yourself, you know, but sure. And I don't think I think publishers still in this world of four ways and five ways or whatever they're doing these days. I just I don't like it. I, I don't like getting. I, I did a four way today and uh, and we wrote a great song. Yeah. I don't think we needed four people. To yeah, do you could have done it with two or three. Yeah, or... Together we can do the job of one man. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <it's> like... <laughs> Yeah, but it's like you know, and 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 it, it and everybody contributed and all that. I'm not saying, but no, I it's like you know, sometimes, not you know, that was a good example of four way. But today, but sometimes it's just too many cooks in the kitchen. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And uh, there's too many different points of view on how to get to from point A to point B. You know, and it's yeah. like, well, if we went around this way, you know. I'm like, <laughs> Let's just go straight to it, you know. Yeah. But you know, it's, I do. Yeah. But it's uh if I had some advice, I would just write 
and write and write and don't worry about the money of it and don't worry about the you know just you know because that if you're if you're really good it's gonna come you know and yeah it'll uh you'll find it you'll find your way you know where do you where do you find your like ideas from just from living life do you like read a bunch of books or i, I don't you know um yeah just just looking around and listening and yeah you know um things you know that i mean i found so many ideas from listening to my wife or watching her or you know and you know how it is of and, course and yeah. my things my daddy said you know and that i forgot about and, I, and it's like Oh, I get that now, you know. I get what he meant by that. I thought it was just, you know, back then it was just like, God, leave me alone. I don't want to hear that stuff again, you know. Yeah. He used to say some crazy things, man. He said, uh, like, he said, he grew up in the Depression, you know. Yeah. And he said, uh, I used to feel bad. He, if you was feeling sorry for yourself or something, he'd say, I, I used to feel bad because I didn't have no shoes till I seen the old boy didn't have no feet. And I thought... <laughs> What does that even mean when I was a kid? But yeah. once I got grown, I was like, oh, I get it now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, wow. There's always somebody worse off. That's than right. You. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a hillbilly way of saying it, I guess. But. Yeah. Man. Yeah, my um, my mom and dad get smarter every year. Oh, yeah. Know? Yeah, no doubt. I was not a – I don't think I was an easy kid to raise. So. <laughs> <laughs> if you can believe that. A little headstrong. A little headstrong. Uh, yeah. I still I still try to remember, you know, Troy, you don't know everything. Even yep. when you think you do. So, yep. yeah. Well, I've uh, – I just finished a uh, project that I've been working on about the last year and uh, with my friend Brad Bohannon down in New Orleans. He, mm -hmm. he helps me do these little recording projects and uh, – I stick them out there and, you know, all the things and like you, you know, yeah. I, 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 I know what the split is when you own it, you know, that's right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, I don't sell enough or stream enough to, to really make a whole lot of money. Cause mm -hmm. I'm, I'm writing songs and I'm going doing gigs and all that stuff. But I know that, uh, when, back when we sold CDs, you could make a little bit of money on the road selling CDs. You know? Yeah. But nobody has a CD player anymore, so I got like eight boxes. And I'd like to let your audience know that I have eight boxes of CDs in my shop at okay. home. And, uh, Where can they get them, though? Uh, Winvarble.com. I right. mean, I'll probably just send it to you if you pay the shipping. <laughs> so I, I'm just all rid of my, my – I got a – my tractor ain't got no place for my tractor, you know. I gotta, yeah, yeah. We gotta, I gotta get, make some. We gotta space. move some copies. Gotta here, move guys. some product. Yeah. All right. Well, this is gonna be the big bump. I think that you need. I think it to, is to I clear it out. Right. So. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Win. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate. Appreciate you. it, man. That's it. Good to see you, Troy. That's the pod. Thanks everybody for listening. Keep rating. Keep reviewing. Keep subscribing. We love you. Talk to you soon. Bye.